Hello, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Box Inc. First Quarter Fiscal 2025 Earnings Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, please press star one on your telephone keypad. I would now like to turn the conference over to Cynthia Hipponia, Vice President, Investor Relations. You may begin. Good afternoon and welcome to Box's first quarter fiscal 2025 earnings conference call. I'm Cynthia Hipponia, Vice President, Investor Relations. On the call today, we have Aaron Levy, Box co-founder and CEO, and Dylan Smith, Box co-founder and CFO. Following our prepared remarks, we will take your questions. Today's call is being webcast and will also be available for replay on our Investor Relations website. Our webcast will be audio only. However, supplemental slides are now available for download from our website. We'll also post the highlight of today's call on the X platform at the handle at Box Inc. IR. On this call, we'll be making forward-looking statements, including our second quarter and full year 2025 financial guidance, and our expectations regarding our financial performance for fiscal 2025 and future periods, including our free cash flow, gross margins, operating margins, operating leverage, future profitability, net retention rates, remaining performance obligations, revenue and billings, and the impact of foreign currency exchange rates, and our expectations regarding the size of our market opportunity, our planned investments, future product offerings and growth strategies, our ability to achieve our revenue, operating margins, and other operating model targets, the timing and market adoption of and benefits from our new products, pricing models, and partnerships, our ability to address enterprise challenges and deliver cost savings for our customers, the impact of the macro environment on our business and operating results, and our capital allocation strategies, including potential repurchase of our common stock. These statements reflect our best judgment based on factors currently known to us and actual events or results may differ materially. Please refer to our earnings press release filed today and the risk factors in the documents we file with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including our most recent annual report on Form 10-K for information on risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from statements made on this earnings call. These forward-looking statements are being made as of today, May 28, 2024, and we disclaim any obligation to update or revise them should they change or cease to be up to date. In addition, during today's call, we will discuss our non-GAAP financial measures. These non-GAAP financial measures should be considered in addition to, not as a substitute for or in isolation from our GAAP results. You can find additional disclosures regarding these non-GAAP measures including reconciliations with comparable GAAP results in our earnings press release and in the related supplemental slides which can be found on the Investor Relations page of our website. Unless otherwise indicated, all references to financial measures are on a non-GAAP basis. With that, let me turn the call over to Aaron. Thank you, Cynthia, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We are pleased to have delivered first quarter operating results above our guidance. This includes revenue growth of 5% year-over-year and 8% on a constant currency basis, in addition to a strong focus on profitability, which resulted in operating margins of 27%, up 400 basis points from a year ago. While we continued to experience headwinds in FX that are reflected in our updated guidance, we were overall pleased with execution in the quarter. As we shared in our last earnings call, we are in a new chapter for Box one that is driven by AI transformation. We saw this in Q1, which was defined by continued AI momentum with customers choosing Box as a platform to enable intelligent ways of working. Demand for Box AI and our upcoming more advanced capabilities continues to grow. And since we rolled out Box AI to Enterprise Plus customers last year, we have seen an increasing number of customers upgrade to Enterprise Plus in order to gain access to Box AI. In fact, we saw a meaningful increase in wins by revenue in Q1, where Box AI was central to the win than in Q4. Customer examples in Q1 include a commercial real estate firm that upgraded to Enterprise Plus for access to Box AI, along with additional security and e-sign functionality. They will be using Box AI to identify patterns across client leases, in addition to client analysis and generating marketing content. 
a leading global commerce company that moved to Enterprise Plus to gain access to Box AI and Box Hubs as they are looking to bring content together in a central location and extract the value from their unstructured content with enterprise-grade security controls that Box provides. Over the past quarter, we've hosted Box AI Connect events across major cities in the U.S. and Europe, and I've had a chance to meet with hundreds of IT leaders and business executives from some of our top prospects and existing clients. What stands out to me is how significant of an opportunity these leaders believe they have around new ways of working with their content and the power of AI. All of the insights necessary to create better business decisions and smoother business processes are living inside of an enterprise's content. It's the key data points inside of contracts that help businesses close new deals, the assets that create a major new ad campaign, the manufacturing and R&D files that enables the next breakthrough product to ship on time, and the financial documents that help close the books smoothly. Yet, for as important as all of this unstructured data is, and it makes up 90% of our corporate information, we've never been able to fully extract all of the value from it. We can't ask questions easily and pull insights from this content. We can't synthesize, summarize, or calculate against it, and only in limited situations, and often with massive investments in labor and intensive processes, have we been able to automate workflows around it. But this is all changing. With the latest breakthroughs in AI, we can finally tap into the full value of our content by extracting insights from it and letting anyone ask questions of this data. We can structure the data within our content to automate our content-centric business processes, and we can better protect our most important information. But we can't do this with traditional fragmented approaches to managing content. Not only are legacy ECM, document management, and collaboration systems too complex and costly to maintain and often unsecure, it's also nearly impossible to leverage AI against all of these silos. This will lead to a continued disruption of the traditional enterprise content management landscape. This is the opportunity that is driving our strategy and that Box is uniquely positioned to accelerate. We are leading the era of intelligent content management, and our Q1 wins and momentum highlight the sheer size and potential of this opportunity. Our intelligent content cloud delivers the most secure way to power collaboration, workflow automation, and content intelligence in a single platform, and we've been building towards this vision for several years. To deliver the full value of content in the AI-enabled era of work and business processes, we are focused on four areas of innovation. Starting with workflow and collaboration, with the beta release of AI-enabled box hubs in mid-May, we are transforming how companies can distribute content through an organization. Box hubs provides a new lens into all of the content that customers collaborate on in Box with intelligent portals that simplify curation, organization, and publishing, no matter the file type or where it lives in Box. This means you can put the right content into the right teammates' hands when they need it most. And with Box AI for Hubs in beta also rolling out to Enterprise Plus customers, viewers can ask questions across multiple documents curated in the Hub and tap into insights from their data with AI to get answers in seconds. Importantly, this provides enterprises an instant way to deliver retrieval augmented generation use cases in AI around large groups of content that can be instantly enabled with no code. With Box AI, customers will soon be able to extract metadata from a large number of document and content types within their enterprise. Once you have metadata on content, you can automate almost any workflow in the enterprise, from invoice processing and contract management to digital asset management and clinical trial management. This is why we acquired Cruise back in December, and we are working aggressively to natively integrate Cruise's no-code application building and metadata features into Box to support powering content-centric workflows on Box. 
We'll share more around how these technologies are coming together throughout FY25. Across security and compliance, we are working to expand box shield features for advanced data security, introduce a new native archiving solution later this year, and accomplish critical compliance levels like FedRAMP High to expand our use cases in the federal government. We are also doubling down on our open platform to support deeper integrations with Salesforce, Slack, Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Copilot, IBM's technologies, and our customers' custom-built applications. To further highlight the power of our platform, at ServiceNow's Knowledge 2024 keynote, ServiceNow highlighted Box as a content repository to demonstrate the value of their Now Assist AI product. Going forward, Box is well positioned to be the platform for providing unstructured data to SaaS and AI providers. Finally, we are working to deliver the most advanced AI within Box with the Box AI platform. The Box AI platform is a critical abstraction layer that securely connects leading AI models to content in Box. Our secret sauce is a set of AI services that we've built out for developers and our Box first-party apps, such as retrieval augmented generation, processing documents for vector embeddings, tool use for AI agents to use within Box, model agnostic AI management, and more. Instead of enterprises maintaining many disparate backend systems to bring AI to their content, the Box AI platform handles all of this for them seamlessly while respecting the inherent security and content access permissions within Box. Importantly, a core part of our platform is that we can quickly bring the power of any AI model to Box content. For instance, we already have GPT-40 working within Box hubs internally just a week after its release. In Q1, we announced a new integration with Microsoft Azure OpenAI, which brought together Box and Microsoft's enterprise-grade standards for security, privacy, and compliance to AI. And also in Q1, as part of Box's technology partnership with NVIDIA, with NVIDIA's newly launched NIM microservices, Box can more easily leverage various AI models and capabilities within Box AI to improve how our customers can unleash the value of their unstructured content. Now, switching gears to go to market. As we outlined in our March Financial Analyst Day, we are focused on leveraging our go to market engine to bring the full value of Box to all of our customers. We continued to see the successful adoption of Enterprise Plus our multi-product offering that brings the full value of the Box Intelligent Content Cloud to our customers. In Q1, Enterprise Plus continued to be well over 90% of our suite sales in large deals, with suites now comprising 85% of our deals over $100,000 in Q1. We saw solid suites attach rates in large deals across all geographies. Our Q1 customer expansions and new wins with Enterprise Plus include a global pharmaceutical and medical device company who purchased Box with a six-figure Enterprise Plus deal for their core ECM platform. They will leverage Box for records management, moving off legacy technology to modernize their content strategy. This will allow them to centralize important records, HR, and customer service data in Box while also meeting GXP compliance for auditable records and a leading broadcast company in Japan that signed an Enterprise Plus upsell to build a secure content platform to prevent unexpected information leaks and to prevent ransomware attacks with Shield. To bring the full value of our platform to our customers, this year we have expanded our demand gen efforts. We are continuing our global AI Connect events and other CIO events. We are introducing all new offerings throughout this year to help our customers modernize their ECM environment within Box, and we are driving larger deals with customers and powering more workflows in partnership with key system integrators. For instance, in Q1, we saw a number of key wins with large customers across critical focus industries with the help and support of key partners. 
We are at a major moment as an industry. With AI, the role of unstructured data in enterprises has exploded, and Box is at the center of this movement within the most important businesses and organizations in the world. Of course, what drives our success is not only our strategy and our platform, but the work our boxers do globally. I'm proud that Box was recently recognized by Fortune magazine as the number 18 in the 100 best companies to work for in 2024, up from number 27 a year ago. Our mission at Box is to power how the world works together. And as a company, we will look back on this as a defining period for how work was shaped for decades to come. And with that, let me hand it off to Dylan. Thanks, Aaron. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Q1 was a strong quarter for Box as we once again delivered on our key financial priorities to drive long-term profitable growth. Accelerating revenue growth in constant currency, expanding operating margins, and executing a disciplined capital allocation strategy to optimize shareholder returns. In Q1, we delivered revenue of $265 million, up 5% year-over-year and 8% in constant currency. This was above the high end of our guidance, driven by strong bookings linearity. We now have approximately 1,800 total customers paying us more than $100,000 annually. Our Q1 suites attach rate in large deals was 85%, a new high watermark, and up significantly from 69% a year ago. Suites customers now account for 56% of our revenue, a strong improvement from 47% in Q1 of last year. As Aaron mentioned, we're seeing strong demand for Box AI and our more advanced capabilities, which has been a key catalyst for this accelerating suite's adoption. We ended Q1 with remaining performance obligations, or RPO, of $1.2 billion, a 3% year-over-year increase, or 8% in constant currency. We expect to recognize roughly 60% of our RPO over the next 12 months. Q1 billings of $190 million were down 1% year-over-year and up 5% year-over-year in constant currency. Q1 billings were in line with our expectations when adjusting for an FX headwind that was 250 basis points higher than we had anticipated in our guidance. Our net retention rate for Q1 was 101%, consistent with last quarter's results. Our annualized full churn rate remained strong and stable at 3%, demonstrating continued product stickiness with our customers. We continue to anticipate exiting FY25 with a net retention rate at or slightly above this level. Q1 gross margin came in at 80.2%, up 230 basis points year over year and above our guidance of roughly 79%, and represents the first time we've reported 80% gross margins. As we continue to realize the efficiencies of running our infrastructure fully in the public cloud, we expect to deliver additional gross margin expansion over time. Q1 gross profit of 212 million was up 8% year over year, exceeding our revenue growth rate by 300 basis points. In Q1, we delivered operating income of $70 million, up 23% year-over-year, once again demonstrating our commitment to generating leverage across the business. Q1 operating margin of 26.6% was up 380 basis points year-over-year, despite absorbing an FX headwind of roughly 150 basis points. Our disciplined approach to expense management is continuing to generate additional leverage in our operating model. As a result, we delivered EPS of 39 cents in Q1, up seven cents year over year, and well above the high end of our guidance of 36 cents. This result includes a negative impact from FX of approximately four cents. I'll now turn to our cash flow and balance sheet. In Q1, we had exceptionally strong free cash flow generation of $123 million, 
up 14% year over year. We generated cash flow from operations of 131 million, a 5% increase from Q1 of last year. Let's now turn to our capital allocation strategy. We ended the quarter with 567 million in cash, cash equivalents, restricted cash, and short-term investments. In Q1, we repurchased approximately 1.4 million shares for approximately $37 million. As of April 30th, 2024, we had approximately 126 million of remaining buyback capacity under our current share repurchase plan. We remain committed to opportunistically returning capital to our shareholders through our ongoing stock repurchase program. With that, let me now turn to our Q2 and full year guidance. As a reminder, approximately one-third of our revenue is generated outside of the U.S., with roughly 60% of our international revenue coming from Japan. Since we last provided guidance, the U.S. dollar has strengthened versus the yen, and the following guidance includes the expected impact of FX headwinds, assuming current exchange rates. Additionally, we expect the non-cash deferred tax expenses that we discussed last quarter to represent an impact of roughly one cent to GAAP and non-GAAP EPS in Q2, and five cents for the full year. For the second quarter of fiscal 2025, we expect Q2 revenue to be in the range of 268 million to 270 million, representing 3% year-over-year growth, or 6% growth on a constant currency basis. We anticipate our Q2 billings growth rate to be in the low to mid single digit range. This includes an expected headwind from FX of approximately 50 basis points. We expect our Q2 gross margin to be roughly flat sequentially, representing a year over year improvement of more than 300 basis points. We expect our Q2 non GAAP operating margin to be approximately 27% which includes an expected negative impact of approximately 200 basis points due to FX. This represents a 220 basis point improvement year over year and a 420 basis point improvement in constant currency. We expect our Q2 non-GAAP EPS to be in the range of 40 to 41 cents, a 12% year over year increase at the high end of this range, even as we absorb the non-cash deferred tax expenses I mentioned earlier. Weighted average diluted shares are expected to be approximately 148 million. For the full fiscal year ending January 31st, 2025, we anticipate revenue in the range of 1.075 to 1.08 billion, representing approximately 4% year over year growth and 7% growth in constant currency at the high end of this range. On a constant currency basis, this represents a $3 million increase versus our prior guidance. This includes an expected headwind from FX of roughly 250 basis points, 80 basis points higher than our previous expectations, representing an incremental $8 million headwind. We expect our FY25 billings growth rate to be in the low single digit range as compared with our previous guidance of roughly in line with revenue growth of approximately 4% on an as-reported basis. This change is driven by an incremental FX headwind, which we now expect to have a negative impact of approximately 150 basis points to billings growth. We expect our FY25 gross margin to be roughly 80%, representing a year-over-year improvement of 260 basis points. We continue to expect our FY25 non-GAAP operating margin to be approximately 27%, representing a 230 basis point improvement year over year. We expect FX to have a negative impact on operating margin of roughly 160 basis points. This guidance is in line with our previous guidance despite an expected incremental headwind from FX of approximately 50 basis points. We are raising our EPS expectations for the full year due to our ability to generate additional leverage across the business, as well as an improvement in our expected below-the-line income and expenses. 
We now expect FY25 non-GAAP EPS to be in the range of $1.54 to $1.58, representing an 8% increase at the high end of this range versus $1.46 in the prior year. This includes the $0.05 cent impact from deferred tax expenses that are noted previously, as well as an expected FX headwind of $0.15, cents, which is $0.05 cents higher than our previous expectations. Weighted average diluted shares are expected to be approximately $150 million. We are embarking on an exciting new chapter as a company, driven by years of investment and innovation in building out our intelligent content cloud. Our differentiated product capabilities will enable us to power AI-driven business processes around workflow automation and enterprise content. As we prepare for the upcoming launch of a new plan offering later this year, we'll be fueling our go-to-market engine through the targeted growth initiatives that Aaron outlined. And with a disciplined financial strategy in place, we've built a strong foundation to deliver long-term profitable growth. With that, Aaron and I will be happy to take your questions. Operator? Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. If you wish to withdraw your question, simply press star one again. If you are called upon to ask your question, please ensure that your phone is not on mute. Your first question comes from the line of Brian Peterson. Your line is open. Well, hey guys, thanks for taking the questions. And so, so starting off with, with AI, uh, it sounds like that's really resonating. I'm curious, do you feel like there's any targeted verticals where there's more interest there? I know you mentioned real estate, but I'm curious how broad that is in, in any discussion on how people are thinking about budgets for that. Would love to get the color there. Yeah, so um, I, I would say right now we're seeing it across, uh, you know, basically every vertical that we see. Um, I think there's uh, verticals where um, over the medium and long term stand to gain, you know, on a relative basis, um, uh, you know, maybe more than others. If you look at things like financial services, life sciences, federal government, you know, categories that typically are very document and content centric verticals where AI can begin to unlock, uh, you know, way more around uh, being able to answer questions from data or automate workflows. So we have seen a high degree of resonance in our conversations in those verticals. But in terms of, you know, where we saw uh, Enterprise Plus upgrades in the quarter, um, it was really across the board. So I, I would say, um, you know, in every vertical that we serve, uh, we saw, you know, uh, strong upsells uh, for, uh, for, for Box AI. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and then in terms of your, your budget question, feel free to build on it more, but I would say, you know, in, in, you know, for right now, because especially it's, it's, um, the capabilities are being unlocked within the Enterprise Plus plan, um, it's still largely coming out of IT budget. Um, it's coming out of, you know, often the spend that we're, we are helping displace from legacy systems. I think over time, if we maybe fast forward a year or two from now, I could see that, that the budget, um, you know, increases. Uh, when you look at line of business that will be able to drive more efficiency because of AI, um, that we're only in the earliest days of what that looks like, but certainly as AI really drives workflow automation and more business process transformation, I think you'll see even increased budget um, that opens up for AI use cases around content. That's great color, Aaron. It, you know, it's great to see you guys raise the revenue outlook in constant currency. I, I'm curious. Anything that you call out in terms of the demand environment or deal cycles as the, as the quarter progress? Thanks, guys. Yeah, so, um, you know, as I think we've noted in the past couple of quarters, um, you know, we, we are starting to see, uh, you know, some degree of stabilization. Again, that's different from any kind of inflection point um, that, that sort of, you know, you know, looking like we're out of the, the woods on the macro front, but, but sort of the lack of increase of, head, of new headwinds, I, I think, has been notable in the past couple of quarters. Um, we had strong performance, especially in our uh, U.S. enterprise business and federal, um, uh, in addition to the U.S. enterprise business. I think we're still seeing some degree of pressure on the SMB uh, segment, but, um, uh, but when we look at the business overall, you know, on balance, we we're happy with the, the performance in Q1, um, and, uh, and we, we certainly look forward to driving more growth throughout the year. Thanks, sir. Yeah, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Pinjalim Bora. Your line is open. 
Oh, great. Congrats on the quarter, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, again, on, on AI, uh, Aaron, what have you seen so far with respect to kind of the volume of queries made by users within the box content hubs for AI? I know it's, it's, it's early, but any color would be helpful. Those, those volume of queries that you're seeing, are those tracking to your expectations so far? And the flip side of that is how has that fared versus the cost uh, side of the equation on the gross margin side? Yeah, so um, so as you note, uh, Hubs has literally been around for, I think, maybe a week and a half um, in terms of it being in beta. Um, and uh, and so we're, we're just getting the early data in. We're reviewing kind of initial customer use cases and, and, uh, and scenarios right now. Um, Hubs already is driving um, uh, about a quarter or so of our, our total AI queries. So kind of right out of the gate, it's been, it's been you know, strong in terms of it's one of the the kind of immediate use cases that, that customers adopt um, just because it's a, such a huge unlock to be able to ask questions of any amount of content. Um, and, uh, you know, as we've noted um, both in our, our keynotes and, and a little bit on this earnings call, uh, the, the use cases are quite vast because um, really there hasn't been another product at, at real commercial scale where you can collect your sales materials and create a sales hub that anybody can ask questions within an HR uh, portal with all your HR documentation that anyone can ask questions in. Um, you know, similarly in, in product and engineering or equity research um, in financial services. Um, I was with a, uh, a CEO of an investment bank um, uh, just about a month and a half ago, and you know, this was a, a breakthrough product for him because instantly now he can enable any new employee in the firm to have as much knowledge access as somebody that's been at the firm for you know a, d a decade or two. Um, and that's, that's basically what we're able to now do with our content is uh, this content really becomes the kind of digital memory of an organization that anyone can tap into. So just this ability to instantaneously make all of your employees um, as knowledgeable as your most experienced employee is, uh, is, is transformational. And so the Hubs use case is going to uh, really be a massive unlock uh, for enabling that in every one of our customers and uh, we think we'll, we'll certainly contribute to more Enterprise Plus upgrades and, uh, and, and more volume. And I think you asked something on the, the kind of gross margin. Um, did, did I catch that or, or the, the, the cost side? Did you, did you mention that? Yes. Yeah, so, so as, as I think we've mentioned, you know, we expect to be able to maintain our gross margin levels even with the addition of AI, um, uh, really driven by the fact that you know, as customers are, are in these higher tier plans, we tend to see higher gross margin in those higher tier plans uh, in, in the first place. And then for a lot of the extremely high volume use cases, things like metadata extraction um, or being able to run a, a workflow uh, that, that generates a lot of AI usage, that will be vo all volume based and not included in the Enterprise Plus plan or, or other plans. Um, and so in, that, in those cases, customers will just be paying us for the volume and we'll, we'll ensure that we're driving the appropriate kind of margin structure um, uh, that, uh, that delivers you know, our, our, uh, our margin goals on that front. Yeah, understood. One quick uh, follow-up for Dylan. Uh, Dylan, seems like the linearity in the quarter was a little bit better. Um, what drove that? Are you are you doing something different to drive that, and could that be sustainable? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say uh, that we did anything uh, significantly different. I um, think just a lot of energy and momentum, uh, you know, heading into the first quarter with some of the uh, product uh, capabilities that we talked about. So really a continuation of some of the Q4 execution and demand uh, around Enterprise Plus uh, driven by everything Aaron's been talking about. So we did see, um, you know, certainly a stronger um, uh, than, uh, than we'd even expected to see uh, start to the quarter, which is what led to, to that revenue upside uh, that we mentioned. Um, so certainly something we'd like to repeat uh, every quarter, but wouldn't say that there is anything, uh, you know, significantly different uh, that we did uh, this time around. I uh, would just point to, uh, you know, really compelling, um, you know, kind of kind of products and, and demand for that, as well as uh, sales execution. Got it. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of George Kurosawa. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking the question. I'm on for uh, for Steve Enders. You know, you talked about. I, I just want to ask about kind of the competition with legacy ECM providers. You know, you talked about AI as kind of helping further augment your relative value proposition. Have you seen any change so far in in kind of win rates there, or maybe the number of opportunities? Yeah, so um, we we are seeing uh, definitely um, uh, directionally an increase in ECM, both full takeouts. 
um, as well as uh, uh, ex expansion deals of customers. Um, you know, when we look at the cruise acquisition, that opens up a number of new ECM use cases uh, for us. So uh, this is a trend that that is uh, definitely moving in a positive direction. And then throughout this year, as we have the more natively integrated cruise offering, um, our metadata extraction capabilities with AI, and we roll that all together, um, you know, in uh, in some of our higher tier package, um, uh, you know, pa packages that uh, that we're anticipating. I think you'll see even further uh, momentum on on taking out legacy ECM systems. But I would call out that this is becoming an increasing trend in the quarter, and in certainly in the past few quarters. And AI just represents, um, you know, I think, you know, another catalyst for customers to rethink their content management environments. Um, and you know, cer certainly there's a there's a very good chance that it'll be the, the defining catalyst, um, just because, again, if you look at, at having millions and millions of documents in a legacy content store, um, it's going to be near impossible to really uh, take advantage of that data in an AI-ready way, um, just architecturally, um, uh, you, you know, given the, the, the complexity there. So we think this is a huge breakthrough uh, for us to use AI to really catalyze even further movement of ECM to modern, uh, m modern um, uh, systems. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, and then a follow-up, you, you, know, you called out a few of your you know, partnerships and you look at your partner ecosystem um, that have maybe been deepened or enhanced by kind of, you know, this renewed focus on AI. Maybe you can just talk about how that's kind of shifted your, you know, your, your thinking on, on the, you know, the partner ecosystem and where you've seen kind of the, the biggest needle move. Yeah. So maybe I'll just share two categories. Um, you have the I actually you know realistically there's probably three categories but um, but uh, so the first is just the models uh, the AI models themselves uh, represent uh, you know fantastic partner opportunities for us um, and you know right now there's there's a number of of leading AI model providers um, that are delivering these foundation models and um, and we you know due to our open uh, architecture and, and model agnostic approach you know we anticipate partnering with with effectively all of them. Uh, and then letting our customers really kind of choose which AI model works best for them. But but uh, by extension, by working and having an open platform, uh, it means that we have you know certainly more incentive for those model uh, providers to you know grow with us in accounts. Um, and so we think this represents you know great new opportunities to work with the Googles of the world, the Amazons of the world, the IBMs of the world, uh, and others as as they need to get their models uh, in front of customers for really mission critical workloads. So that, that's that's kind of one partner category. Another partner category is if you think about all of the AI products that uh, that you you hear about in terms of of whether they are these sort of assistant use cases or co-pilot use cases, uh, the, these all of these uh, AI assistants and SaaS applications uh, really thrive by having access to to data in a in a sort of AI ready or very easily usable way, um, and uh, and so we. Uh, have one of the leading platforms for managing a significant portion of corporate data that is incredibly mission critical and very useful uh, within the context of AI, and we can connect into these AI products, you know, relatively seamlessly. Uh, you know, again, certainly way way more seamlessly than any kind of legacy architecture uh, or infrastructure. And so that was the example of you know ServiceNow, uh, where Box was was highlighted, you know, in their demo as as a content. Uh, platform that, that that you connect into to ask questions of uh, within their their assist product. Um, uh, we similarly have expanded our partnership with Microsoft and Microsoft Copilot uh, to be a, a content platform that connects to Copilot. Um, and you can just kind of go down the list of of really any kind of software product that that talks to data or needs access to data. Box represents um, a really uh, you, you know, secure, scalable platform to connect into those AI systems. And then finally, this is also opening up. Um, really, a number of use cases around system integrators uh, or other types of partners that can plug us in as a as a sort of piece of the architecture for having an AI ready uh, document management or unstructured data platform. And uh, you know, this is really where we can embed our AI capabilities more deeply um, in a set of products. So, uh, for instance, you know, we've had conversations with a leading vertical uh, SaaS provider where you know, box and metadata extraction, you know, using AI becomes a very relevant. Um, uh, an increasingly important component uh, for uh, uh, for their platform capabilities. So that's sort of the B2B2C um, or B2B2B uh, type environment where, you know, through another SaaS platform, our technology will be embedded because it really gives them a leg up um, in AI document processing. 
So those are a few of the categories that, that we're spending time on from a partnership standpoint, each of, each of which is you know, almost nearly net new um, in terms of use cases for customers or growth opportunities for us. So we're organized against those, uh, those opportunities right now, and I think over the next couple of you know, quarters and then certainly years, uh, you'll see a lot of um, uh, continued traction on that front. Awesome, Kelly. Thanks for taking the questions. Yeah, thanks. Your next question comes from the line of Josh Baer. Your line is open. Great, thanks for the question. Um, one for Aaron and a quick one for Dylan. Um, Aaron, I've followed your insights around the cost of AI, the cost of units of work, and the potential for AI agents. What are we going to see from Box in, in that respect? You know, How does Box fit, fit into this AI agent uh, future of work? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> as you uh, as you you can probably tell, I'm uh, unbelievably excited about about uh, this this prospect. Um, uh, I'll I'll keep it at a relatively high level because there's obviously still announcements to come in this space. But when you think about um, you know when when you use AI within the Box AI platform, uh, we have created an abstraction layer that that effectively talks to an AI model, connects that uh, in, to content in Box. Um, and that model, we, we give it a set of prompts and, and instructions that it follows, and then effectively tools that, that within our platform that that AI model can interact with. You know, one of the tools is, um, is being able to do vector embeddings. Another tool is um, uh, being able to do uh, effectively this, this sort of enhanced or enterprise RAG uh, service that, that we've created. So if you think about um, the AI model has a set of tools, uh, it has a prompt and set of instruction, and that, that all gets abstracted um, uh, in something that the user doesn't have to, you know, worry about any of that complexity. They are just talking to effectively what is an AI agent that does um, that does a specific task, task like uh, summarize a document or ask a question within a hub or extract metadata. Uh, where this gets extremely powerful is is um, uh, as AI models continue to advance, as our as our AI platform capabilities continue to advance, you'll be able to deploy, you know, effectively these AI. Uh, agent experiences across really any uh, use case around your content that maybe a human otherwise would go and do. So, um, you know, today everybody has workflows where a human reads a contract and they pull out the metadata from that contract and then they route the contract to, um, you know, someone in their organization. Or a human looks at uh, a digital asset and uh, labels that digital asset for some kind of digital asset management process. Uh, so in, uh, within the Box AI platform, you'll effectively have AI agents go and, and do those things for you. Um, and we're, we're you know, building out the tooling to let you organize and manage um, and um, uh, effectively you know, administrate all of that, that AI labor, as it, will, as it were, um, you know, within the Box environment, and then, uh, and then tie that to business processes and workflows within Box. So, so our mental model at Box is to kind of take any work today that we do with content um, and, uh, and basically be able to have AI go and do that work. And uh, we are building the, the, all of this scaffolding, abstraction layer, and platform services uh, to make that possible. And what, where that becomes extremely you know, um, uh, exciting for us is if you think about that 90% of corporate data that, that is unstructured or that is content, um, the vast majority of that data today is not tied to an automated business process is not data that you can kind of look into or ask questions of, um, is not necessarily sort of uh, secured in the best way possible uh, from, uh, from, from an advanced, um, you know, highly contextualized, uh, you know, standpoint. And in the future, uh, AI is going to let you go and do those things. And so we are uh, going to open up, um, you know, a, a wide number of use cases that today we don't have automation in the enterprise to go and solve. Um, you know, where the traditional kind of RPA or IDP process um, was just too labor intensive um, or, or too complex to go and deploy across every department in your organization. Uh, that's what, we're, uh, what we see as the potential for AI. So um, basically, when a customer thinks content and they think AI, uh, that is what our intelligent content cloud uh, is going to be delivering for them is that end-to-end -end platform set of capabilities uh, to deploy AI against their, their content securely. So does that answer the question? Yeah, perfect. Really cool. interesting. Thanks. And then Dylan, just one um, clarification. Really appreciate the details on the FY25 revenue guidance change and like breaking out that um, on a constant currency basis, the guidance increased by $3 million just with all the moving parts. What about for the billings guidance as far as the change in constant currency or any change for FY25? 
Yeah, so really, um, you know, it, it, uh, our expectations are consistent uh, with our initial guidance uh, on a constant currency basis. Uh, so there, is, as we had kind of talked about, you know, roughly in line with what our, our reported revenue growth expectations were at the time uh, of about 4%. Um, from a constant currency uh, standpoint, uh, that's still what we expect. Uh, but on an as-reported basis, uh, you know, now expecting that to, to land in the uh, low single-digit range uh, because of that uh, uh, kind of incremental and new 150 basis point uh, headwind that's coming from FX. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Your next question comes from the line of George Iwanek. Your line is open. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, Aaron, I'll start with you, uh, and maybe in the context of Box AI and Box Hubs, but uh, you know, you're seeing this sweets momentum. Uh, can you give us some perspective on how that's driving other products like Box Relay and Box Sign and the adoption you know, really broadly across the Box platform? Yeah, so so in general, you know, every time obviously uh, our Enterprise Plus plan gets gets purchased, um, that that opens up a, a number of new use cases and, and value propositions for customers. Uh, our advanced e-sign capabilities, um, our most advanced version of Relay, uh, and so we are certainly seeing that open up, um, you know, more more value and more stickiness for customers. Uh, Q1, um, we had some notable wins. You know, for instance, in the sign space, uh, major pharmaceutical company that. Um, uh, that will be adopting BoxSign for their validation processes, a major um, uh, automotive company that will, will be using BoxSign uh, for kind of critical customer transactions. Uh, so, so again, our, our whole vision is really when you, you know, implement Box as an intelligent content cloud, you get that entire life cycle of content from the moment you create and ingest data to that final kind of transaction to then governing the content, all of that is in one streamlined experience. And so whether you come in because of workflow or collaboration or e-signature or AI, um, you know, our, our job is to make sure that you're seeing the full value of the platform overall. Um, and AI, again, just represents uh, a, a major catalyst for customers to really think about uh, the role of, uh, of, of content in their organization, in their enterprise. Are they getting as much value uh, from it as, as, uh, it is, as is now possible? And uh, Dylan, one question for you. Now, maybe expanding on your com comments related to, uh, you know, investing in demand generation. Can you give us kind of a uh, how you're investing, where you're investing, what uh, kind of focus you're putting on the, the sales organization and marketing organization? Sure. Uh, so, so really, um, you know, it kind of comes back to a lot of the the programs and and uh, kind of growth initiatives that uh, Aaron uh, highlighted in his prepared remarks. So I would call it, you know, kind of a combination of uh, really doubling down on and scaling uh, some of the demand gen, uh, both, uh, you know, kind of programs uh, that are, you know, kind of online spend to a lot of those CIO focused uh, field events uh, that have been working really well for us over the past couple of quarters. Um, so now, and especially with, uh, you know, all the exciting uh, kind of newer products that we have coming out, um, uh, you know, seeing, seeing really strong uh, interest uh, and demand from customers uh, there. So that's one category is kind of straight demand gen. Um, also uh, investing in building out uh, that partner ecosystem uh, that we talked about. So uh, especially with SIs and just kind of strengthening uh, our overall uh, reach uh, through some of those channels. Uh, and then, you know, at the same time, we will be, um, you know, kind of growing our sales force as well, commensurate with the, the demand that we're seeing uh, and to set us up for that, um, you know, kind of uh, a growth uh, and uh, kind of laying the foundation so we're ready as we do have the new products uh, to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the high-level categories uh, that we've been really focused on this year. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Rishi Jaluria. Your line is open. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, guys, so much for taking my question. I have two specifically on the workforce. Uh, number one, you know, I know you've talked for, for years about wanting to do more hiring uh, outside of the U.S., especially in Poland. Maybe can you give us an update on that kind of global workforce strategy and what, what percentage of your uh, workforce is actually outside the U.S. at this point? And then maybe alongside that, um, SPC is, is now taking near 20% of revenue. It's growing faster than revenue. I know there's, of course, some takes to how that is measured, but maybe walk us through 
why that's the case. I, I understand you're buying back shares and, and it's more than offsetting dilution, but I guess I'm not sure that issuing a lot of stock instead of cash and then buying back stock with cash is necessarily the, the right strategy instead of shifting more of the compensation away from stock into cash. Maybe just help us understand both of those as it relates to your workforce. Thanks. Sure. Uh, so on the first one, um, you know, been really, really pleased by the results that we've seen uh, in terms of our uh, workforce and location strategy, uh, most notably in uh, in Poland, uh, where you know we ended this past year uh, with more than 300 uh, uh, employees on the ground there. Uh, so a little more than 10% uh, of our workforce uh, and kind of moving quickly uh, into the teens, and that includes. Uh, more than 30% uh, of our engineering team. Uh, so that's where the primary focus has been, where we're hiring the significant majority of, uh, of uh, kind of the R&D uh, hires that we're making in Poland, uh, but also a lot of our GNA functions, um, for example, as well, uh, and expect that uh, to continue to increase the percentage uh, of the overall mix over time. Uh, and then as it relates to the stock-based compensation, would note um, that, you know, maybe just a, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, we actually, even with, uh, you know, and kind of independent of the, the robust uh, share repurchase program uh, that we have in place that's been uh, bringing down total shares outstanding uh, over time, at the same time for, for um, you know, a couple years running now, we've also uh, reduced the overall equity burn rate. Um, so we are uh, actually issuing fewer net shares uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, the reason uh, that SBC has not, uh, you know, kind of yet followed that same path uh, is uh, kind of combination of, um, you know, we have seen very, very strong uh, retention, so low attrition, and, and largely comes down to a higher share price. Um, so it's a little bit more of a lagging indicator of the overall equity practices that we put into place uh, the last couple of years. Uh, but just like we've seen in uh, our burn rate and, and total shares outstanding, uh, we, we would expect uh, stock-based compensation uh, as a percentage of revenue to follow that same trend uh, and come down over time as well. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yep. This concludes the question and answer session. I will turn the call to Cynthia for closing remarks. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we look forward to updating you again on our next earnings call.